Welcome to today's webinar presentation, Bridging Difference and Power with Respect, a Relational Approach to Patients, Supervisees, and Teams. I'm Lynn Osborne, Director of Business Development at the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare, and your moderator for today's session. The Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to strengthening the relationship between patients and their clinical caregivers and preserving the human connection in healthcare. Before we begin the formal presentation, let's go over a few details about the webinar. The Schwartz Center Compassion in Action webinar series is funded in part by a donation in memory of Julian and Eunice Cohen. Today's program will be 60 minutes. The first 45 minutes will be presentation, followed by a 10-minute question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded and will be available on the Schwartz Center website a week after the session. Please note that attendees are participating in listening only mode, but can interact with the speakers and me by using the questions pane, which should be appearing on your screen. If you have questions, please just type them into the questions pane and send them to us, and we'll address as many of them as we, as we can at the end of the formal program. We'll also be polling the audience during this session, and we hope you will participate in this measurement tool. As you exit the webinar, you'll receive an electronic survey that we ask you to take a minute to complete so that we may measure your assessment of today's program. Your feedback is really important to us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our host for today's session. Dr. Beth Lown is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Medical Director of the Short Center for Compassionate Care. Beth? Hi, thank you, Len, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to have my dear friend and colleague, Carol Mosta, with us today. Carol is going to discuss the RESPECT model and how caregivers can use this model in their daily practice, teaching, and supervision. The RESPECT model is a relational model that addresses differences in power, and it identifies skills to build trust with patients, especially those who differ from the caregiver in race, culture, or background. It's a helpful training tool that can guide preceptors and supervisors to partner with learners, supervisees, and colleagues across differences in hierarchy, which can be quite challenging at times, as we know. The webinar will include educational tools for observing, communicating, and supervising with respect. New work using respect to address diversity and hierarchy on multidisciplinary teams will also be highlighted. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Carol Mostow, LICSW, who directs communication skills and psychosocial training for family medicine residency program at Boston Medical Center, where she's an assistant professor of family medicine at the Boston University School of Medicine. She is a graduate and a faculty member of the American Academy on Communication and Healthcare and is a facilitator for the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare at my hospital with me, Mount Auburn Hospital, and also at the Boston Medical Center. She also trains faculty, trainees, and healthcare practitioners at all levels uh, and in community and hospital-based settings to better understand, communicate with, and support their patients and each other. Carol. Thank you so much, Beth and Lynn. It's such a pleasure and privilege to join you today, especially to connect with some of the extended Schwartz Center community of caregivers and others committed to compassionate health care in the U.S. and beyond. As a facilitator, this just feels like an extension of our larger community, and it's wonderful to be on the line with so many of you. I'm happy to share with you the RESPECT model, a tool discovered with colleagues with whom it has also been an honor to work and learn. Um, and as Beth mentioned, today we're going to be discussing some ways to use it to improve relationships with our patients, supervisees, and each other. So on slide five, we can see the learning objectives for today. We will begin with why and how the RESPECT model was developed, including the teaching dilemma, which exemplified the challenges. Uh, we will very briefly touch on some of the data that supports our model. And then um, using a clinical example, we're going to practice applying it to see how it can help us connect with patients from backgrounds different than our own. Then we're going to try a second different application, which is to see how RESPECT can help us engage and partner with our supervisees and trainees to address the challenges they face. And then finally, uh, it will be a very brief introduction, but I'm really uh, excited about our latest work 
applying respect to teams. Um, we think that those uh, addressing hierarchy and diversity can help uh, strengthen the team's capacity to identify, face, and adapt to challenges, all that are so important, and continue this uh, building compassionate cultures in healthcare. So we're going to be covering a lot, but um, a week after the webinar or so, there's going to be references and handouts uh, posted. So you can be, you'll be able to review all of this at more leisure. So uh, moving on. Uh, the journey to respect began as much as medicine does with a problem I wasn't sure how to diagnose or treat. The problem was a particularly burned out and besieged feeling intern from one of my small group interviewing seminars attended by all interns in the Department of Medicine. On that morning in 1999, he came to class complaining of the political correctness of the in-training exam, which is nationally required um, for all trainees at that level, and he had just taken it the previous day. So he came in complaining and made four statements, which had stuck with me all these years, but which I was unprepared to respond to at the time. He starts off, these guys, if they hadn't been up to no good in the first place, wouldn't have gotten shot. Their problem is they're hanging out with the wrong people. When I was their age, I never would have hung out with those guys. Now, you should know that uh, I, I don't know if you, like me, knew exactly whom he was talking about. The young, unfortunately, mostly black and Latino young men who were victims of gunshot wounds in our city. Um, but then he went on to talk about other things that were bothering him. I'm also tired, I'm sick, sick and tired of having patients change my script. So then I felt like I could say something about it. And I said, well, no, you don't have to put up with that. That's illegal. But then he said, well, um, I get out late at night and have to walk to my car. Now, what would this stir up in you? To get an idea of what this stirred up in me, you should know that uh, prior to training residents, I had worked at a local community mental health center and the nearby public middle school during an epidemic of gun violence in the 80s, where children were afraid to walk to school, they would tell me. And a boy who would return to school uh, following several months hospitalization for massive internal injuries was one of my patients. He had just been hanging out on the street with friends and got uh, almost mortally wounded by a stranger in a drive-by shooting. Another confided he buried a gun on school grounds, which he retrieved when he walked home so that his reputation would protect him from attack. So the picture on slide seven may well capture some of what I felt as he continued. I know not to say this to the attendings, but you want us to be honest, right, Carol? I struggled with my outrage uh, to try and figure out what the issues were and what I could possibly say that might be helpful. So thinking of the three parties, the patient, the intern, and the instructor, what are the challenges and risks? For the patient already at risk for disparities, they enter healthcare already traumatized and risk even further alienation as they encounter a provider biased against them who already blames them for their injuries. Clearly, this is going to be a barrier to effective engagement in ongoing healthcare. The trainee himself displayed a total lack of knowledge and awareness about his patient's social context. The difference between their resources and options and his, I neglected to mention that I had asked him where he grew up. And it was a white middle class suburb. So clearly he was clueless about the way his life had in fact differed than his patients. And he was also totally confused about poverty, race, substance abuse, and had no skills to address any of them. And then beyond the knowledge deficit, I could hear in his plaintive account some of what he was feeling. Burned out, powerless, at war with his patients, and losing. So the job of a teacher, if, if you were his supervisor or teacher, I don't know how you would have handled it. I had to manage my own feelings because I realized he already knows it's unacceptable because he doesn't speak this way around the attending. But he does need my help. I mean, I'm in fact his teacher. So he's doing the right thing and confiding in him, me. But I have responsibility to his patients that he's going to see over the course of his career as well as to him to help him build the skills he needs to be effective and to be able to partner with his patients. But I didn't know what or how best to teach him. 
So uh, what could I do? As you can see the deer in the headlight feeling I had. Never worry alone, as a wise mentor often states. So I started with senior medical faculty at educational conferences. They diagnosed the problem of his unprofessionalism and that I lacked the power to make him comply. But since this intern could act professional around faculty, the critical issue was how unskilled he actually was when he was with his patients. The solution would not be to silence him, but rather to figure out how best to engage him to learn more about his patients, engage with them regarding their needs, and how best to build trust with them. Turning to slide eight, we see some members of the diversity curriculum task force to whom I turned with my questions. We formed in the year 2000 over 30 wonderful colleagues who had dedicated their careers in the formerly public hospital serving Boston's poorest and most racially and culturally diverse patients. Unlike the intern, these physicians felt effective and they talked about feeling inspired by their patients. They had design programs as well as interpersonal strategies to meet their patients' needs. What were they doing that made them feel rewarded by the same work that overwhelmed the intern? And how should we teach these skills in a busy clinical setting? These were our goals. As slide nine reminds us, effective training programs address knowledge, attitude, and skills, particularly in an evidence-based culture knowledge about disparity data and patient experience can be helpful. Uh, you know, knowledge uh, and data actually motivate people who value data. And it, that can help make us think that maybe we need to take a second look at what we're doing to make improvements. The Institute of Medicine volume on unequal treatment was certainly an important contribution in this area about disparities in healthcare and outcomes. But even the most recent JAMA published online March 9th has a uh, an editorial and articles by Bauschner, Martin, Harris, Jack, and Wong, uh, pointing out that unfortunately disparities persist with lower life expectancies and worse health outcomes. The march to equality is far from over, and we need continued vigilance and creativity to forge effective partnerships in and outside of the office to make a difference for our patients. So, in terms of addressing attitudes, Slide 10 includes our favorite exercise to promote self-awareness, a key component in the journey to cultural humility, which, by the way, is a, a term that Kapina Kode uses, and I really prefer it to cultural competence, because it really captures the fact that it's a journey all of us are on, not just a, a list that we can somehow master. Um, based on Pinder Hughes's groundbreaking work, this exercise can be used alone and with others to encourage reflection on difference in power in one's own life. Um, again, I'm going to include the learning objectives and facilitator guidelines that, that I wrote uh, in material to be posted after the webinar. Since it has wonderful benefits as a sharing exercise, if done with sensitivity and safety guidelines to remain safe and non-confrontational, our teams have loved having a chance to really learn just in a few minutes things that you never knew about someone and it helps you get closer and uh, really does flatten the hierarchy in a wonderful way. Um, however, uh, moving on, uh, the greatest contribution we made to the field was in the area of skills, which we also felt was critical in terms of actually doing something about knowledge regarding disparity data and the desire to make a difference. Um, as and so we are at more risk of a bad attitude about problems when we don't feel effective solving them because they make us feel bad. You know, we don't like to feel like we're failing, and we tend to either feel bad about ourselves or blame the patient. Um, so building skills can themselves uh, improve attitudes. So we started scanning the field to find out what skills had been identified. On slide 12, we see the cross-cultural skills identified by leaders in the field that we have, in fact, incorporated into the RESPECT model. Uh, Arthur Kleiman, psychiatrist and medical anthropologist, uh, is the one who brought attention to the explanatory model, which is incredibly useful as a way to capture the fact that patients and physicians can have totally different ways of understanding what's going on in their bodies, uh, what's the illness, and what might help. And it can be particularly helpful across cultures when people really have totally different ways of understanding many things. 
Um, although it's also useful just when a patient thinks um, they need an antibiotic and you think they have a virus. So explanatory model is really a, a cornerstone in the whole area of cross-cultural communication. Berlin and folks are built on this and talked at the end is for negotiation. Uh, how do you negotiate the differences in explanatory models between patients and physicians? Betancourt, Carrillo, and Green uh, coined ESFT, again, uh, building further on the work done by Kleiman and then Berlin and folks to add fears and concerns as well as social context, and it's actually have written more about the social context. Uh, it includes valuable attention to the way limited financial resources, access, health literacy, and other stressors, what people may call social determinants of health, uh, may be equally or more salient to healthcare outcomes than belief. I might want to and agree that I should do something, but if I have no way to get to it or pay for it or uh, get my child care, you know, all those things might in fact be the thing that keeps me from being able to pursue uh, my health. Now, uh, the next slide shows respect, and you can see that we built on the valuable work that's done by these pioneers um, and added relational and affective components that we had begun to feel were critically to actually building trust. In the context of inequity, distrust, and stigma, we needed to do more than elicit information about our patients' thinking. We needed to demonstrate our trustworthiness and build the relationship. What, what, how are we going to prove? Why should people trust us <laughs> instead of assuming that they should, especially with the way the world is these days? So how did we propose to do that? By showing respect, sharing power, showing empathy, and building rather than assuming trust. We also expanded on the social context information as mentioned previously to make sure that we elicited strength, support, and spiritual resources along with our patients' stressors and limitations. So, I know it's a lot, but in sum, respect is an action-oriented communication skill set to build trusting relationships across barriers of difference and power. We will discuss the model in more detail, but just a word about respect itself. As slide 14 asks, what is it? You know, it's funny, we developed the respect model and used it for a year or two before we even tried to figure out a definition for the word. Uh, and maybe, in fact, it's something that you know it when you see it and you feel it when it's missing. Um, and as a matter of fact, part of what even cued us into its importance was one of our role play practices. We would try out different patient encounters and try to put our finger on what it was that seemed to be operative in really building trust and a relationship. And the person playing the patient remarked to the clinician, it was when you came down to my level to sit beside me, that's when I started to feel more open to you. You know, and it's interesting if you think about the word, what it means to look down on someone, right? There's something about coming to the same level, something uh, clearly respect and power are linked. And clearly nonverbal and tone of voice are very important. But in addition, um, what's the message that respect conveys? It conveys that you and your concerns are important, that you have value and choice. When power and stigma are problematic, respect really can be an important part of the solution. So on slide 15, we're going to have our first chance to apply the respect model to a clinical encounter as we meet Mrs. Gomez and Dr. Smith. To begin with, we will listen for respect which is an exercise similar to one which will be among your posted resources called Looking for Respect. And by the way, that's been a useful tool to use to watch the way trust can be built or not over the course of an interaction of what's going on. It can be used for self-reflection, observation, or for assessment purposes. <clears throat> it's been well received and in use for years at our medical school and adapted at, uh, at the University of New Mexico and possibly elsewhere. So. We want you to listen to this unhappy encounter between a clinician and a diabetic patient. Which elements of respect are present? Are elements of respect missing that might be helpful? And I'm sure you're going to be able to think of one to two statements or behaviors that may have made the encounter more effective. 
Okay. Dr. Smith sighed as she saw Mrs. Gomez's name on her schedule. Mrs. Gomez was a 39-year-old recently diagnosed diabetic with a strong history of family diabetes. However, despite A1Cs of 14, Mrs. Gomez had been irregular with her medications and had failed attempts to change her diet and exercise patterns. Dr. Smith knew what had to happen this time. Nice to see you, Mrs. Gomez. Thank you. Now, have you made any of the changes we discussed about your diet and exercise? No. I don't have fresh vegetables available in my neighborhood. And like I've been saying, I've been too busy with my job and family. I don't have time to exercise. I can't afford rice and beans, and that's all I have time to make. But Mrs. Gomez, I told you, something has to change. This high blood sugar is going to kill you. If you can't make changes on your own, there's really no choice. You're going to have to start insulin injections. But I told you I don't want to do that. My mother lost her legs and then she died after starting insulin. I can't do that. But no, that was the di that that was the diabetes that did that, not the insulin. There's no choice. You have to take it. I'm the sole provider for my family because I left a bossy husband who said I was worthless and always told me what I could and could not do. My friend said you're a good doctor, but nobody tells me that I don't have a choice. Now, I'd like to turn to Lynn for our first polling question. Thanks, Carol. Our first polling question is coming up on your screen, and uh, we'll give you some insight into your interpretation. The question reads, does Dr. Smith show concern for Mrs. Gomez? Please select one of the following responses, yes or no. We'll wait just a second and give people a moment to vote. And good, I think we've got a good, good feedback. Oh, a couple more coming in. There we go. Uh, we've got a good response. So let's close the poll and share the responses. Um, all right. Let's see. Forty-seven percent of our audience is tell participants are telling us yes, and fifty-three percent no. Carol, any thoughts on those results? Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, I, so I think people can hear uh, the dilemma here. And um, I think what this question brings up is the difference between feeling concerned for the patient and communicating it. Uh, and I think our audience probably broke on each side of that question. I think many of us probably think that Dr. Smith felt concerned for Mrs. Gomez, and in her sense of urgency about the insulin was communicating that concern. But the question is, was it expressed in a way that Mrs. Gomez could feel it? In fact, have you ever noticed with people that you care and love that uh, sometimes your caring can turn into nagging and scolding? Anybody who's had teenagers or spouses might recognize that sometimes it's harder to convey caring effectively than to feel it. And then also, what opportunities were there for the physician to respond to the patient's emotions, convey empathy, and share power to partner more effectively regarding a solution uh, more likely to address her concerns. Clearly, the way it ended was not good. So something needed to change. No matter what Dr. Smith was feeling, some, she was going to have to try something different in order to have a better result. So let's move back to the presentation. And we're going to be exploring in more detail how Dr. Smith could respect Mrs. Gomez. Uh, but first, let's discuss some of the data that supports why to use respect. It turns out a number of subsequent surveys and studies have confirmed that uh, respect components are clinically relevant to patients' concerns and experiences, even though it was originally developed as an educational tool for training purposes. So in fact, all patients want and need respect. A large-scale study of SIGICAP scores showed that respect by one's physician is the single most powerful predictor of patients' overall rating of their physicians in 27 out of 28 specialties. That was a 2014 article. And uh, just January 2015, Consumer Reports shared large survey results linking patients feeling respected by their physicians with actually fewer safety problems and better workplace safety scores. So again, all patients want and need respect. And to illustrate the point, 
We have here this year's 2014 Schwartz Center Compassionate Caregiver winner, Dr. Thea James. She's an emergency room physician, an assistant dean of our medical school, one of my wonderful colleagues, and one of the co-authors of the RESPECT model. She, like the other doctors and uh, nurses and fabulous uh, colleagues with whom I work, does try to provide the same level of respect, empowerment, empathy, and compassion to all her patients and to build trust in every encounter, even though in her case, she often has just a few minutes in a medically acute circumstance to try to establish it. Additionally, as slide 18 demonstrates, however, there is evidence that respect may be particularly important for patients from racial and ethnic groups at risk for disparities. Indeed, as you can see, many of the components in pain are in fact areas of racial disparities in physician-patient communication. In terms of respect, African-American, Hispanic, and Asian patients do feel less respected by physicians than do white patients. In terms of power, white physicians dominate speech more with non-white patients. Empathy is an area of disparities as well. Um, white doctors display less warmth and patient-centered behaviors with African-American patients. And there's a lot of uh, data about trust, uh, including that a third of whites believe that their doctors had already or might experiment on them without consent, which is horrifying enough. But the lasting impact of Tuskegee, as well as other negative racial experiences uh, found by Dr. Gazelle Corby Smith, um, shows that almost twice those numbers of African Americans believe the thing. And then Gordon and colleagues found that the fear of mistreatment, while that's important to recognize, is not the only kind of disparity. In fact, in an observational study, white doctors indeed did offer less support, partnership, and information to their black patients, further lowering their trust. So let's continue now and apply the respect model to the encounter between Dr. Smith and Mrs. Gomez. So, Looking at the respect slide, did Dr. Smith show respect to Mrs. Gomez? She did start out politely and even said it was nice to see her and did use her proper title of Mrs. Gomez. And I think people might have responded to her kind tone of voice or what we would have kind of know maybe showed some caring. In the photo we saw she was looking at the patient and not lost in the chart. However, respect is important not only at the beginning but throughout the interview. As we look further at the definition, we can see that Dr. Smith did nothing to convey Mrs. Gomez's dignity, the validity of her concerns, and completely disregarded her autonomy. By the time we saw the photo, her eye contact kind of showed displeasure at Mrs. Gomez because she was disagreeing with her. So you need to recognize and affirm the patient's efforts, choices, and accomplishments throughout, from the beginning through, uh, through it. And so, for example, given the life that Mrs. Gomez describes as a single working mother, it's impressive and positive that she made it in to see her doctor to address her own health. Let her know that that's what you think. You have so much to take care of with your work and family, yet you still made it here today. Continuing to the explanatory model on the next slide, Dr. Smith did nothing to explore Mrs. Gomez's understanding, but the patient actually volunteered some ideas including that insulin had made her mother's disease worse and led to the amputation. We don't know if Mrs. Gomez had any symptoms of disease, diabetes, which she herself was concerned about, and what she thought they were caused by. And again, you could have allied with her by trying to figure out more what her understanding was. That would have been a way to engage her. Uh, and in fact, maybe there would have been something else you could have been partnered with her about. So you should remember that even with patients who don't display overt differences from your from years, uh, their understanding of what is wrong and what will help can differ greatly. And uh, Lang points out that unless you deliberately ask in a series of, uh, in a study he did, most patients had a number of ideas about the cause and potential solution to their problems that were not mentioned, leaving room for great under misunderstanding, hidden disagreements, and uh, which is the music to the ears of uh, many busy clinicians, it's inefficient and you're just missing the boat with each other. Moving on to social context, it's important for all our patients, but um, can, in medical charts, uh, get reduced to smoking, drinking, and occupational risks because busy clinicians get afraid they don't have time to ask for more and they you know, kind of disregard its relevance. But obviously, whether it's negative factors that are limiting one's access, um, 
and resources or stressors that can make your symptoms worse, or positive uh, support, strengths, and spiritual resources which could help patients cope and manage their illness and their life, it's a critical area to learn more about and can really, in a very practical way, help you help the patient manage the challenges they face. It doesn't have to take a thousand questions to help do it, and we've listed some that could be helpful. So what about Mrs. Gomez? Again, Dr. Smith didn't even express interest, so that was another opportunity lost. Um, and again, we heard both the negatives, uh, the financial stresses, lack of access to healthy food or time, the family and work responsibilities, and uh, that she had a, an emotionally or potentially even physically abusive uh, marriage. But if we take a strength-based perspective on it, Mrs. Gomez shared that she successfully left a man she felt devalued her, and she's managing to raise her children on her own and hold down a job. So reflecting on this strength with the respect it deserves would have been another way to partner, as well as to find out how she's coping with it all. And does she need some extra support, and is it available in her extended family, her spiritual beliefs, church, or elsewhere? Uh, would there be a way to give her some breathing room so she could prioritize her health? And maybe uh, in the patient-centered medical home team model, there would be a colleague who'd know of uh, services that could be added uh, to alleviate financial stress, to find healthy food, et cetera. Now, moving on, um, the RESPECT model involves sharing power and control, as we can see on slide 22. The clinician's the expert usually best uh, acquainted with the disease and treatment options, but it's the patients who know uh, what they understand of their illness, the impact on their life, what their preferences are. And in fact, they're the ones who have to live with whatever decisions are made. So you can see some suggestions on the slide regarding how to share power with the patient. How does this apply to Dr. Smith and Mrs. Gomez? Uh, clearly, it was a total battle uh, for control and an inability to share power. Um, Dr. Smith, either because she was too burned out or too anxious about Mrs. Gomez's A1C, couldn't get past this to recognize that Mrs. Gomez by necessity, is in charge of whether and how she deals with her diabetes. While Dr. Smith's concern about Mrs. Gomez's diabetes is warranted, she neglected to find out why Mrs. Gomez was even there in terms of how she hoped that Dr. Smith could be helpful. So by never getting her, the patient's agenda, the doctor missed another chance to find a way to partner around something that might be helpful and build trust with Mrs. Gomez. Even if they never ended up agreeing about the insulin, maybe they could have built a partnership that could, over time, find ways to promote her health. Regarding empathy, on um, slide 23, were there opportunities in our scenario for Dr. Smith to express understanding, to show care, concern, and respect, uh, and to convey that she understands what Mrs. Gomez's life is like? Uh, yes, and I think uh, we know Dr. Smith missed them because she was too focused on the A1C, and you probably all noticed where that could have happened. What if she had expressed understanding at all those different opportunities? Um, one, again, wouldn't have that been able to strengthen the partnership? And then what about her fear about insulin? Dr. Smith corrected her misunderstanding, but she never addressed the emotion and fear. So the results come off just as a dismissal. Uh, might it have been easier for Dr. Smith to explore options with Mrs. Gomez if she felt like Dr. Smith understood her, cared about her, and respected the life she worked so hard to maintain? So again, we have some quotes here uh, that maybe she could have used. Um, no wonder you're afraid of the insulin since you think it made your mom lose her legs in her life. You feel so responsible for your family. I really respect that. But does it ever get hard to have it all riding on your shoulders? So demonstrate empathy. You know, it turns out that uh, not only is there an area of disparities with white doctors showing less warmth with black patients, there's actually an empathy deficit in general in healthcare um, where it's rarely expressed. Now, why is that? Uh, participants in workshops and empathy share many factors, and I'm sure any of you can probably think of times when you were either too preoccupied um, by problem solving to address the emotion, or perhaps desensitized because the experience is not as difficult as other ones that you've seen, um, or um, worrying that it would take too long, which is the reason why it's really helpful to practice some of those skills. 
And then sometimes physicians feel compassion, but just don't know what and how to say something. And uh, there was a very poignant example, which I probably don't have time to get into totally, but just of a, an intern who talked about how upset he was uh, when a patient disclosed having been raped. And he was so upset by the experience, uh, but he said he felt he didn't know what to say, and he didn't want to say the wrong thing, so he didn't say anything. I said, so what did you do? And he said, I just tried to take really, really good care of her. And I remember thinking, you know, I tried to reassure him. I'm sure that he leaned in, that he spoke gently, that probably in all sorts of nonverbal ways he conveyed his compassion um, to the patient, and she probably felt it. But it's still unfortunate that he was so worried about making a mistake that he didn't say anything. And if, in fact, he'd just given voice to his natural feeling that she didn't deserve this, that uh, he wanted to take good care of her, um, and that how he was grateful that she had chosen to share it with him, I'm sure he would have felt better and she would have too. So whatever you do, remember to notice and respond. Um, now, concerns is another important area that Dr. Smith could have addressed more, as we see on slide 24. Um, now, again, we did learn about Mrs. Gomez's fear of insulin, but there are other underlying concerns that we never found out about. Um, and so finding out this uh, could have provided another opportunity. What worries you most? Any other concerns I should know about? These are always valuable questions to ask at the beginning as well as the end of the visit. Skipping these questions can often lead to unmet medical needs and patient dissatisfaction. As we look at trust on slide 25, we realize that after all these missed opportunities, it's not surprising that Dr. Smith didn't earn it. Um, and although in this case we know that Mrs. Gomez disagreed with uh, Dr. Smith, in many cases because of the power dynamic, patients are afraid to let us know that um, they don't have any intention of doing what, they, what we've suggested, or they don't have the ability, or it's going to be too hard, or other things are getting in the way. So aren't we better off finding that out while they're still in the room? Um, I'm going to just go through the next one uh, very quickly in the interest of time, but there's critical um, skills about how to do interactional education that you can see on slide 26. Um, that uh, are mostly from the American Academy on Communication in Healthcare with the Ask, Tell, Ask model, which again helps you get where the patient's coming from, target the uh, response, and then check back in to see what they understand, how they feel, what they want to do. Uh, it can be very helpful. And again, on slide 27, um, if you have successfully elicited that the patient indeed does have views different than yours regarding the problem, the solution, or the priorities. See if you can find common ground or other shared goals. In other words, don't assume you're on the same page. Uh, compliance rates are less than 50%, so it's your responsibility to elicit the evidence of what's actually going to happen after the patient leaves. And over the long haul, building trust means that perhaps you'll have time over, uh, over the long haul to work on things or at minimum, the patient will feel better about the next uh, healthcare encounter they have. So um, continuing, we see that we've talked about what the RESPECT model is, why it matters for patients, and especially for patients at risk for disparities, and how to apply it in clinical encounters with patients to build trust. But um, in real time, we actually wouldn't even know about this encounter if we were the supervisor, right? We wouldn't be listening in, and unless Mrs. Gomez uh, filed a complaint, we wouldn't even know. So how do we, we actually have to work with our supervisees. And so that really suggests that we should become self-aware about our own power. How do we make sure that we're approachable? Um, so supervisees will tell us that things aren't going well and ask for help. And secondly, if our supervisees are floundering, how do we manage ourselves? Thinking back to that opening uh, anecdote, just unloading my displeasure with the intern about his attitudes would have done nothing to help him build skills or to help his patients. The only way to do that is to build partnerships with our supervisees. So on slide 29, we see we have come to the second major goal of the Diversity Curriculum Task Force, how to teach the skills. Now for um, 
uh, medical student level lectures, guided observations, reflection, and sharing exercises worked well. But for clinicians, we need to integrate the learning into the clinical setting and into the supervision relationship for the reasons we've mentioned. Also, remembering adult learning and motivational interviewing tells us that for people to change their behavior, they have to want to and believe they can. And single acquiescence, uh, just doing what someone says in that moment has nothing to predict about what people are going to do when they're on their own. We need to use respect, empathy, and empowerment to build trust with our supervisees. Why is this important? So for one thing, there continues to be a documented decline in empathy in the clinical years in medical school as well as over the course of residency. And this is true for staff as well as for trainees because we're all vulnerable to burnout. We are so close to suffering, overwhelming social problems, illness, death, and other problems that are not easily resolved, including sometimes the most frustrating ones are the systems problems. That's the thing that's just going to throw you over the edge. So as Skinner discovered, positive reinforcement is actually extremely effective. How do we find ways to support the best of what we all bring to healthcare and make our learners and supervisors comfortable to share their challenges so we can support each other? Uh, social workers will recognize the term parallel process, but it means using the same kind of open trust with the supervisee that you want them to have with the patient. An empathic rather than punitive stance aligns the learning climate and modeling incentives and goals. We want to make sure to uh, notice and reinforce the caring that people have, um, and otherwise the message is that it doesn't matter. And then finally, employee engagement and morale in turn impact patient satisfaction and organizational outcomes. It shouldn't be a surprise that none of us can go on empty for so long. So again, we want to support and empower our supervisees. Now on slide 30, we see that the first time we would be likely to hear about Mrs. Gomez would be um, when Dr. Smith mentions it to us. Let's think of how supervising Dr. Smith with respect might help. We see Dr. Smith uh, complaining, she won't even consider insulin, but she hasn't made any other changes I told her to. I'm presenting um, her, though not sure what's even the point, because she doesn't seem willing to do anything to help herself. So uh, is there anything here to respect? Looking at slide 31, well, yes. We're glad she's telling us about the visit, because they need our help. We're glad she worked hard to get Mrs. Gomez to come back. The fact is that she's so upset because she cares. This is good. And even though her over-controlling style is inept, uh, the motivation is good. Reinforce her investment in Mrs. Gomez's health by telling her you know how hard she's been working. In slide 32, we see that rather than launching into telling Dr. Smith what to do, seek her explanatory model. What does she think is going on? Uh, this, again, conveys your interest in Dr. Smith and helps her think about what might be going on with Mrs. Gomez. The next slide reminds us that social context is important for everyone. Um, and again, uh, not only is there a decline in empathy, there can be a decline in well-being. And one of our faculty discovered that a resident she thought was really disengaged was actually clinically depressed. When she got treated, she was reinvested and successful. So you need to learn what's going on in order to be able to diagnose the problem. Uh, slide 34, empower your supervisee, just like you hope they will do with their patient. Dr. Smith is feeling very ineffective, uh, which can lead to burnout, discouragement, and cynicism. Lynn, can you please pull our audience to see what they think is the most empowering response to give to Dr. Smith? Here we go. <clears throat> Poll number two, thanks, Kara. Our second polling question is coming up on your screen right now. And the question reads, what response do you think might empower you, your supervisee to be more effective? Please select the response that reflects your opinion from the following responses. You're the doctor, number one. You're the doctor. Just go tell the patient she needs to take insulin or the diabetes will cause her even more problems and shorten her life. Number two, you can't make the patient do anything. It's up to her what she chooses to do. Number three, you have a patient with a sky-high A1C. What are you going to do about it? Number four, how might you find out why this patient has a hard time taking her medicines daily? 
and we'll give folks a moment to respond. Coming through. Okay, we've got a good response, so let's close the poll and share the responses. Let's see. Zero hmm. percent said number one, two, and three. Oh, sorry, so three has one percent. You have a patient with sky-high A1Cs. What are you going to do about it? Everybody, <laughs> Carol, yeah. how might you find out why this patient has a hard time? I think they've been listening, Carol. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, you're all, uh, you're all good at this, which is terrific. Uh, because we need you out there, because uh, all the people in the trenches need their, your support. So that's terrific. So I think it's obvious to you that number one empowers Dr. Smith, but only <laughs> leaves her in the same uh, to repeat her threats. Number two is true, but it reinforces Dr. Smith's sense of powerlessness. Number three is, is uh, I, I like it too in the sense that it's challenging to have Dr. Smith formulate a plan. Uh, but she's already alarmed about it, and she doesn't have any tools or skills to try something different. So number four could stimulate Dr. Smith to think of some solutions. All right, so we're going on, and I'm going to pick up the pace a little just to try to cover a little bit more. But uh, show empathy. We all need to let off steam and detox. So uh, let her know that you uh, get it, uh, and even the us language. Um, it is a joining kind of statement. Um, and it also helps, uh, as you look at that second statement, uh, sometimes it's hard for us to remember that right now other things might feel more important to the patient. Remember, there's no such thing as uh, too much empathy. There's enough empathy for everyone to get some, just like at a good Schwartz Center round. Um, you, empathizing with staff doesn't mean we need to blame patients, just like empathizing with patients doesn't mean we need to ignore how frustrating and challenging it can be for caregivers. And actually, empathic support at work can restore and recharge. As Dr. Lown herself has written about, the Schwartz Center rounds, in fact, helps us renew because we get a chance to do this with our peers. It, um, peer support programs also show that people rate their workplace as higher safety scores if when they're down and out, there's someone there that's there to support them. So uh, slide 37 says is that uh, make sure you continue to encourage your supervisees to bring you their concerns and challenges so that you can help them think it through. And again, slide 38, trust is key. Um, this is what's going to allow you and your supervisee to partner around the real challenges. Um, it's great that Dr. Smith chose to bring up the case of Mrs. Gomez. The patient was at risk for dropping out and for poor outcomes. Dr. Smith is at risk for cynical discouragement from investing in her patients. Thank her for the courage to share what are very common challenges in care and very worthy of attention. So I think I could only, the briefest way, if you can go to the next uh, slide, show the team model for respect. Um, but I think you'll realize how we've been talking about the same sort of issues. Um, an atmosphere of respect is helpful throughout, but can be established from the very beginning in the way new members are welcomed, their contributions appreciated, and the strengths and diversity of the members valued. You, this way, you establish an inclusive environment where all feel welcome. Then you get to exploring the ways people differ, which is, can be both enriching um, as well as potentially bring up some rubs. And so you get better at uh, conflict resolution. But you want to build. Um, understanding and shared mental models. And uh, as you bring the wisdom of the team together, uh, you're able to more accurately figure out what the problem is. Um, and again, diversity comes across discipline, job title, personality, as well as race, culture, class, sexuality, everything. And it's all a resource for the team. Who we are as people and what our background has a major impact on our team participation. I've been doing this on the inpatient service with the resident team. And it's amazing what one little 30-second fact that everybody shares about themselves, how that changes the stress level and the sense of community there. Um, and uh, power is incredibly important in safety cultures, as we know. Um, and so uh, leaders are encouraged to share power. Leading from the side becomes important. Uh, empathy, critical to help us feel supported, as we were mentioning earlier. And it, again, it strengthens safety culture scores. So in the end, you hopefully have a, a team 
that's sort of like the team that I had with my colleagues when we formed uh, Respect. Um, everyone's valued. We bring together the best of ourselves and the diversity. We invite participation across the hierarchy. Everyone feels like they can raise concerns. Uh, leaders know they can count on people to mention potential problems before implementation so that everyone's on board. I hope you've all had that experience. Um, on slide 40, you'll see two citations, one from the 2010 article that has all this material um, about the patient and learner, and the other one is in um, development about that will be available through uh, the American Academy of Communication and Healthcare. Um, it's going to have um, demonstration videos and all sorts of terrific resources. Um, and I want to, again, on slide 41, just express my great gratitude and acknowledgement both to my co-authors on the prior page and these original contributors. Um, as I mentioned, we all ended up working together, uh, and it was one of the most meaningful collaborations that any of us had experienced. The work we do in healthcare is hard. We all need to build teams and relationships that help us sustain ourselves, each other, and our patients, that help us do our best, and then learn how to do it even better with and for each patient and each challenge. We hope that RESPECT will be helpful to you in these efforts. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, these are wonderful insights. It's a terrific model. I think it's really extremely helpful for teaching and supervising. Uh, I wonder if we could turn some to some questions and answers. Lynn, do you have some questions from our audience that we might offer to Carol? I do, Beth, and thank you. And thank you, Carol. We've now had a number of questions, but before we begin, a reminder to our audience. If you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, you may still do so. Just type the question into the questions pane, and we'll answer as many as we can in the time that we have. So our first question is, uh, Carol, how does your approach apply to work with children? So um, I think children and adolescent autonomy is important, uh, and empathy helps across um, ages. I, and actually, I invite those who work primarily with children, if you start using this, please let me know, uh, because it hasn't been a, a direct focus, but I certainly think it's applicable. On the other hand, I think the examples that do come to my mind are, um, one was we work with some eye care professionals. It turns out respect is very malleable and can be really applied to any clinical situation. And so we found it useful uh, with a real uh, encounter um, of a Somali mom who was afraid to let her uh, child have an MRI uh, to rule out a tumor um, based on visual problems. And reframing this from a neglectful mother who was in the way of treatment to a protective, loving mother who was worried about and trying to do her best to protect her child from something she feared was dangerous was just a very important reframing. Also, uh, broadening the social context allowed us to think about how in this traditional uh, woman with a, from a very different culture might there be supports in her social network, like an imam or somebody else, who could be a bit of a bridge to help reassure her and to help build trust with the more traditional medicine uh, folks who really wanted to do this imaging. Um, similarly, in the middle school, I certainly had to learn that some of these very moms who kind of valued strictness a little bit more than I did with my more permissive, lenient, child-centered way were, again, operating in a world where they had to worry about how their children would be perceived and treated by others, ranging from their physical safety, if they disobeyed and went out at the wrong place at the wrong time, to uh, whether they would be discriminated against if they were uh, came across in anything less than uh, an impeccable manner. And again, I had to sort of shift my own thinking. So I think working with parents is extremely helpful. But I welcome my input from those who, who work with uh, kids more primarily. Excellent, Carol. Thank you. Uh, I think we've got time for just one more question. Uh, can you give an example of how supervisors might inadvertently undermine their goals through the hidden curriculum or parallel process? 
Yeah, um, there was one uh, clinic I worked at where residents were worried so much about what they were going to ask when they left the room um, that they would, you know, tended to shut down their patients' concerns, didn't want to get into it, just would pepper them with closed-ended questions. And they said, I don't have time because when I come out, I'm going to have to report on X, Y, and Z that I'm going to get asked by my supervisor. And in fact, um, the supervisor was totally unaware of the impact that his interrogation style was having. And when I talked to him about it, he ended up scheduling a session about how to get to know your patients. He actually valued patient-centered care. He just didn't realize that his teaching style of sort of pimping was undermining the kind of approach he himself valued. So it was helpful. Awesome. I think you answered that one so quickly we can do one more. <laughs> can you um, co comment uh, how your approach interfaces with motivational interviewing? Yes. Um, well, you know, clearly that warrants a whole training in and of itself. But I think it's extremely compatible. Bottom line, uh, you know, in terms of power, uh, it, motivational interviewing gives you a chance to share power and acknowledge that, that it's only the patient who can change. Uh, it, it gets you out of this power struggle and control, which in fact you can't really do. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's futile anyway. But what you can do is create a safe, respectful, and empathic place to facilitate change. And in fact, my understanding about motivational interviewing is that empathy itself is more powerful than fidelity to protocols. Um, it, that it's the most effective piece of motivational interviewing. Um, so it, it, again, it's empathy and power, I think, and respect are all very compatible. And it, it's not surprising to realize that it's easier to address something we find challenging when we feel supported and understood. Fantastic. Me. <laughs> perfect note to end on. Beth, would you like to make a final comment? Oh, I'd really just like to thank Carol for her insights and her expertise, as always. I think this is a very important model, and I think it does integrate well with the key precepts of empathy, of compassionate care, of motivational interviewing. It's all about understanding and aligning yourself with the patient and with your trainees. And we teach who we are. As we are with patients, so are we with our trainees, and it's helpful to point out that parallel process, as you said, Carol. So thank you so much for, for this wonderful webinar. And we'll look forward to hearing from others uh, with any questions they may still have. Awesome. And to, uh, to quote one of our um, audience out, out, who's just written in to me, you rock. Great session. Thank you, guys. Wonderful. <laughs> I would again like to thank Carol for sharing her expertise and insights, as well as everyone in the audience for setting aside time in your busy day to participate and to play with our polls. We hope that you will join us for upcoming programs at the Schwartz Center for our um, Compassionate Care webinar series, including what's coming up next, Effective and Compassionate Communication for Shared Decision Making on May 12th. Um, family meetings, improving patient, family, clinician communication on October 19th. Please keep an eye out for our invitation emails. Please visit www.theschwartzcenter.org for program details and to learn more about the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. We know how busy you are, but we'd very much appreciate your taking a moment to complete the survey upon exiting this, the webinar. Thanks, and have a fantastic day, and happy St. Patrick's Day.